Welcome everyone. I'm very honored to be here and lead a panel about women leading with STEM. Before the registration, I reach out to Sean at the USPTO to connect with us and continue the conversation. Also at the end of this symposium, you'll be given links and resources to learn more about innovation and engagement of women within the ecosystem. I'm very proud to be able to introduce the following panelists. Paula Golden, President of Broadcom Foundation, Dr. Mary Oskin, Professor at University of California, Riverside, and Dr. Dee Sangita, Founder and CEO of GoTerra. I will ask the panels to please uh, provide a two to three minute introduction to yourself, starting with Paula. It's a real pleasure to be here and an absolute honor. Um, I am the president of the Broadcom Foundation, and the foundation focuses especially on middle school students who we believe are really ripe and ready to become STEM, STEM innovators and specifically young coders who can use coding for the purposes of advancing their activities in STEM and to make the world a better place, of course. So we are very pleased to be here. Our foundation is 10 years old and our focus is on middle school with a real emphasis on under-resourced and underrepresented students. Thank you very much, Paula. And next, uh, Dr. Askin, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, this is Miri Askin. I'm a professor for 22 years uh, at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in University of California, Riverside. I'm a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, and uh, our research has resulted in 47 granted and 10 active patents in the fields of lithium ion batteries for electric vehicle and smart grid applications. I have broken the glass ceiling many times uh, by being the first or only in engineering. I am uh, really looking forward to our panel discussions today about women's uh, entrepreneurship. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. And finally, Sangeeta, do you mind go ahead and tell us about you? Thanks, Megan. I'm really excited to be here with some really high uh, performing women here. Um, uh, my background is from uh, corporate America uh, with uh, over 25 years of experience in a variety of different industries, mostly male dominated. And Early in my career, um, I was actually awarded 27 patents that I'm probably most proud of in my whole career <laughs> of uh, 25 plus years. And then um, I quit about three years ago, I quit Amazon and launched my um, startup, Gotara. It is an AI ML based platform that is uh, to help uh, uh, pro uh, women professionals, uh, women professionals in STEM plus fields. Uh, so it's a little beyond STEM fields um, and it helps uh, them retain in the workforce and help create pipeline of leaders for the employers. So this way we not only retain the women in the workforce and help them become leaders, uh, we also help employers save a whole bunch of money in replacement costs, which is about $9 billion a year. And then hopefully we help with the GDP of the communities that we all live in. And, um, and it has been very exciting three years for us. And we have a bunch of customers who are working with us. And we have about 22,000 members across 170 countries on the platform. That is fantastic. And thank you all of you for your introduction. So today we're going to be hearing the stories of how these women are succeeding and what else we need to do. So a recent LinkedIn article read, for women in business, the ladder is still broken. Just 38% of leadership roles in the United States are occupied by women and things start to go awry at the manager level. But this gap is closing and we have seen significant improvements since 2006, especially in more STEM heavy fields like technology, energy, and manufacturing. However, relatively, these fields are still the lowest share of female representation in the overall makeup of industries. And furthermore, the World Economic Forum's recent report stated it would take another 132 years to close the global gender gap. 
Let me repeat that one, 132 years. The people on this call today probably won't be alive. <laughs> the good news though, from this report is that in recent years, women have been establishing businesses at slightly higher than average rates for men. So with all of that, what we wanna do is encourage that gap to get closed faster. So each of you are leaders and have promoted women in STEM and in business. So Sangeeta, let me start with you. Can you talk a little bit more about the efforts and activities of the company you started? Why did you do that? And how are you working within this field to make it more accessible for young women? Uh, so I'll actually begin with my own story. Early in my career, um, in one of the jobs, I actually um, technically challenged corporate audit staff where my work was being audited. And uh, um, I was, I felt I was right and it should have been accepted, but my mentors, the CEO and the CFO did not support me. And I was so stressed out till two months when the data came in, I was proven right. Um, I was ready to quit and I thought I may get fired. I didn't know. And what I realized was I did not have to go through that stress. And uh, a lot of women go through that kind of stress, stress and I wish I had Gotara, uh, uh, something like Gotara at that time. So what I would say is um, of all the professional population, women in STEM are treated at the highest rate, 40 to 50%. And what do we chalk it up to? Uh, and, and usually that happens within five to seven years after they graduate from college or graduate school and they come to the workforce. Um, and we chalk it up to, uh, well, they are at that age, they want to raise families, that's why they're leaving. And on the surface, it looks right. So when I was sitting at the table having that discussion, I said, okay, maybe an exception, she's an exception. Most women feel that way, and I just left it at that. I didn't have time to research and explore. And after I launched Gotara, I personally interviewed technical leaders that I truly respected, and I would hire them any day. And we have behavioral data now on a Gotara platform for the past three years. Both of those pieces of data confirm that 95 to 96% of the women who left the workforce were forced out of the workforce. They never wanted to leave. It was toxic work culture. And the interesting thing is every employer does exit interviews. And what do you find in exit interviews? It was for compensation or scope of the job. And I can tell you, every job that I have left, I did not give the right reason why I was leaving. I probably could have stayed in one company forever, but I didn't. And there was a reason. And employers and the senior leaders have good intention. However, they don't know. They don't know what is going on at the lower levels or the middle levels where they're losing these women. And that is where Gotara comes in. We get, uh, we catch these things just in time, mentor them, coach them, upskill them to fight for themselves. And on the other hand, we also work with the employers and their managers to make sure they're watching out for things like that and helping women uh, stay and grow in the organizations. Fantastic. And so talking about that mentor program, Paula, can you share a little bit more about what you all do to help mentor young women who are coming up so that they can have that support built in early on? You know, I think the story we just heard is very instructive. Um, if you have confidence and you believe in yourself, um, you might you might be able to sustain um, your values and your your uh, uh, story, whatever that story is that you're trying to get out there into the business community or the STEM business community, um, with because you have that confidence, you don't start that process in college. You don't start that process, as far as I'm concerned, in high school. Young women really need to be brought to a level of confidence about their abilities and their right to be uh, a STEM professional and engage in innovation at a very early age, which is why we focus on middle school. In middle school, young women are beginning to define themselves as women and also as young people. For the first time, they can leave their parents' side and go out into the world. 
And it's when they're first challenged, actually, as to whether or not they have a right to be in STEM. I myself am a lawyer, largely because no one encouraged me in middle school to stay with the STEM that I was very good in. So I, I see myself as a classic failure of the process. And we should be looking at priming the pump with programs with young people in the after school space and classes where we can. I really believe after school lends itself very neatly to young women building up their confidence, whether it's in a Girl Scout program or 4-H or a code club. There are opportunities where they get that sense of camaraderie that they need at a very early age so that they can sustain themselves when the stresses begin. And the stresses begin in high school. They start, they start feeling the pressure to leave the STEM fields and turn them over to the young men. And it's it's simply something we have to build the muscle, muscle mass much, much earlier in our young people. I love that. And certainly the leaky pipeline, as we've heard it called, is something we talk a lot about. So for those who don't have somebody, um, Mary, you mentioned you were the first in your department. So what are some of the patterns you've noticed over the years about women like you who go into these STEM-related fields and some of the challenges you're facing? And how are you helping the next generation to overcome those challenges? I think uh, as an academician, uh, what I think is uh, leading the way uh, is a silent form of mentoring. So I have done that in many venues in engineering. Uh, for example, I started uh, filing patents as a PhD student at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in UC San Diego and have four patents, granted patents from my PhD. And uh, secondly, uh, setting an example of a supportive ecosystem to promote entrepreneurships of women and men in my research group work very well. And uh, so this is like a micro eco environment that I built in and my students are co-inventors in all my patents. And I attended the University of California's uh, President's Woman Initiative for Professional Development Program to cultivate a professional network of women that you know, spans the UC system and strengthen the skills, confidence, and strategic relationships. As an academician, I have implemented my learnings uh, from this workshop to my micro environment. And uh, I and the, the company leader panelists here, uh, we all have worldwide influence and in leading the way and creating a supportive ecosystem, I think can make not only national, but also a global impact. Absolutely. And, and certainly, as all of our listeners uh, watch this live or listen to the recording, please come join our networks. We want to connect with you. We want to help to support you in your community and in your goals. So, Sangeeta, leading others is a combination of the lessons you've learned, as well as the personal ambitions and goals. And you mentioned you left the corporate world because you saw that lack of opportunity and you wanted to create a space for people to have those networks and have those mentoring. How do you now work to create new opportunities for women to connect with other women back in the corporate world as well as outside of it? So um, when, when I decided to launch the startup, um, this is how I felt. Um, uh, reaching executive roles in the uh, aerospace, energy, and technology fields. Um, I was, if I can do it, other women can too. Why aren't there more women? That was my question. And, and I'm able to coach and mentor women. And, and, and many of them would say, uh, hey, that 15-minute conversation 40 years ago changed the trajectory of my career. And, and it, it just didn't happen to me, other women too. How do you take that and help scale that up so you can help not just five or 10 women, you can help millions of women. And that was the purpose of starting Gotara. 
So the platform allows for any women to join our platform for free where they can give advice in a confidential and personalized fashion within 24 hours from women who have lived in their shoes. So we have, so for example, we could have somebody from Dubuque, Iowa, or somebody from, from Nairobi, Kenya, uh, asking a question about their career or the hurdles that they're navigating, how do they navigate those hurdles? And they may get somebody from, um, I don't know, Silicon Valley uh, CTO, who they will never be able to connect otherwise. And they get real advice. So these pieces of advice, so for example, I have personally also given advice, and I use my real use cases to say, this is how I handled it. And looking back, these are other two ways you can handle it. And so this way, now they have a couple of options to go after to navigate that hurdle very quickly um, and, and not have to wait. Um, so when we are doing that, we are seeing that the programs that we are running, where we call it career sprints, where the uh, employers actually nominate these women to come through our program, for eight weeks and they stay on the platform beyond that, where they are essentially coming with a three to six month goal. And we help determine what are the targeted upskilling they need or mentoring and coaching they need through the eight week period. It's a self-paced program, 80% tech, 20% human intelligence. So a coach runs alongside with them. And they are able to solve the problem, whether it is about them getting promoted to the next role or them having a big initiative that they're launching and they are afraid about something that is that they have not done before, whether it is process or innovation related, we help them through. And our expectation is that they are going to accelerate their careers in that year that they go through the uh, career sprint. And our hope is, and we always say, hashtag spiral up, you get to a certain level, you are at a tipping point where you can start changing the rules. If you don't like the rules, the way they are set up, the leadership rules or the constitution or whatever it is, start changing the rule when you are in a position of power. Activism helps, but it takes a long time. When you are in a position of power, you can change a lot of things. So that's what um, our goal and spirit behind Gotara is. That, that is fantastic. And certainly having that opportunity with the global scale and engaging with people all around the world makes a big difference for creating a network. You're not in your own ecosystem. You can get support from someone wherever you are. That's right. But you mentioned hurdles and you mentioned changing the environment. So part of what are some of the policies that are going on today that can eradicate some of the systemic hurdles that we see within the system so that we can better support our women entrepreneurs? Well, I mean, there, there's some government, there's certainly some government initiatives right now in the United States that I think are, are very important. And I think they'll be emulated in other countries as oftentimes they are. The Chips and Science Act um, has should have a huge impact on women in STEM because there's a lot of money there in education, which actually is being released, I think, uh, very soon, if not already, from the National Science Foundation in the form of grants to encourage more underrepresented people uh, to become uh, digitally literate and be part of the, the massive changes that are gonna go on as our technologies are all brought home for manufacture. So I think that the CHIPS Act is one impetus and has a lot of, a lot of uh, opportunity for young, young, not only for young women in the age group we're interested in, but for people who wanna go back to school in community colleges. I think this is a very important act. The other is national broadband, again, something that I think is being emulated around the world, uh, strengthening the ability for people to get onto computers and access information directly, gives young women particularly a chance to find their tribe. And by that I mean, when I look at TikTok or I look at Instagram, um, I look at these and I see real opportunity, particularly for young women, who seem to really be very comfortable with the social uh, maybe sometimes too comfortable, but comfortable with the social uh, media. And I think that we need to learn how to tap into that uh, cleverly to give kids um, a better sense of community around the issues that we want them to focus on, which is really developing courage and confidence in the areas of their STEM interests. We now have a program called I uh, hashtag 
iCode, which is designed basically to give kids a place to go and see other kids who are coding and what they're doing and uh, keeping it simple, but opening up the doors of communication so people can find a community because that sustains them uh, in, the, in the short term and in the long term. Fantastic. And certainly we've heard the theme of community over and over again. But Mary, when you joined, you were surrounded by a whole bunch of men. And so your community was not other women. We often have these conversations around women supporting women. But can you talk a little bit about how the men in your life were able to help you to develop the community? What do you do to make sure that you got support, not just from other women, but other men as well? Uh, so let me kind of like go a little back and uh, answer some of the questions uh, asked to Paula and also Sangeeta, and then also cover what you have asked. And uh, I think uh, women are as capable as men in any subject, including STEM. So what we need is to give opportunities to women to start and advance in the career. Uh, to create a supportive uh, ecosystem, both in academia and industry, is highly crucial. So considering that, you know, 50% of the global population is women, if we don't do that, it would be a waste of talent and help. So since everybody has to work jointly on this, women cannot do this by themselves, so there has to be a supporting ecosystem, which in engineering mainly males. So that's why they need to be uh, in the game and they really need to create a supportive ecosystem. For example, since I'm in academia, so I will be giving some examples uh, from academia. Uh, some universities actually are way ahead than others, and a lot of the room actually to improve the, and encourage and support women entrepreneurs in engineering in many academic settings. For example, filing patents were not even considered for the merit and promotion cases as academic excellence until recently. For that reason, I haven't even, you know, I'm a faculty for 22 years, not until recently, I haven't even included my full patent list in my merit case. And, uh, and then if you consider actually, you know, how much effort you have to give to file a patent and then for patent to be granted, which takes maybe 10 years or so, that long process, and compared to a paper that you are, research paper that you are submitting, which will be actually taken care of within a few months with the revisions and all that, actually a lot of uh, bread and, you know, sweat goes into filing a patent and to be granted. So that's why I think um, the academia needs to realize how much effort a faculty has to give to file a patent and, and then get it granted so that they should give, uh, I guess, the credit accordingly into their promotion uh, and then merit case evaluations. Because uh, this is not what's happening till now, uh, this was very discouraging for many faculty members and it will prevent devoting their time into entrepreneurship and patent filing. This is not only for women, but also for men at the same time. So I have chosen my, you know, that uh, closing my ears and uh, <laughs> lead the way with a hope that uh, what I have done will influence other women in my campus and uh, they will still not be discouraged even there are not even a supportive, uh, you know, men admins uh, in their department, college, or the campus. So uh, that's why uh, I think what you are doing at the end of the day is for yourself and for your future children. So you just need to lead the way. 
and and do what you trust, what you believe in, what is important for you. So again, uh, coming back to your question is, uh, I think men and women has to work together to create this supportive ecosystem and uh, and then uh, be, uh, I think, open-minded about uh, or female faculty or male faculty uh, who would like to be entrepreneurs in academia. Absolutely. And you mentioned uh, using patents as part of the promotion process. So let me just advertise that it's PTI, Promotion and Tenure in Innovation and Entrepreneurship. There's an organization that is working to implement that at academic campuses. Uh, especially in the United States, but it is a global conversation. So if you'd like to join that conversation, please do so. It certainly is an impact when all of the activities get recognized equally and equitably within a search for academics careers. So moving slightly, uh, Sangeeta, within the group that you're working with, are there any ways for men to show that mentorship or support and how can they feel welcomed and that they belong within this ecosystem as well? Yeah, good, very good question. Um, I always say clapping happens with two hands. You can't clap with one hand. So men are, so Mihir is absolutely right that we need men in our lives and in our careers as well. Um, I will actually answer that question with an example. So I'm going to give an example of a woman who is a participant, a real participant who went through our program. And she came in, she was an engineering leader with 16 years of experience. And she butted heads with an operational leader um, about fixing bugs. They could not come to a conclusion and fix uh, for six months. They would just go back and forth, back and forth. And she was just frustrated. So she wanted to learn how to manage conflicts. And when we looked at her situation, we said, no, no, I think you need to have the skill called have tough conversations. And, and she did, she went through that, learned tips, tools, and techniques. And uh, lo and behold, the next uh, uh, bug uh, comes across and within that eight week time period, they actually helped solve the bug within two weeks that used to take six months. And suddenly, and then she takes this guy that she really disliked uh, out for lunch and recognized him. And so the relationship improved, she felt valued and respected, and the business benefited from it. Now, the question is, why wouldn't that operational manager um, do something about it? Why was it the woman able to fix this? And so this is where we actually launched um, a Voyager program for managers of teams who want to have high-performing teams leveraging diverse talent. And we know diverse team are higher performing teams than homogenous teams. Uh, over and over, the data has proven in every organization. And, and so now, and, and, and some of the, these men have actually come to us and, and said, maybe I'm not saying something that I should be saying. Maybe I shouldn't be saying something that I'm saying. It, most of these people have good intent. They want to do the right thing. Sometimes they just don't know. And, and we want to, of course, empower the women, but we also want to empower these managers, people who have uh, opportunity to impact the lives of others and careers of others. So they're going through a very similar program just in time, upskilling, mentoring, and coaching. And my expectation is that now we'll kind of ex ex accelerate that change for, for women and for the whole organization in the process. That is fantastic. And certainly I think I, I would uh, echo that with a call to men who want to be involved to reach out and realize that we need all of you to be here at the conversation. So one of the things that we want to do with this conversation is not just look at the past or look at the present, but look to the future. So Paula, where would you say the future is for the middle school girls that you're working with today? Where do you want to see them in 10 years or 20 years? 
question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, one of the one of the elements that we promote at a very young age is teamwork. And we believe that if you set up teams of both boys and girls together and they have those problem solving challenges presented to them and uh, at an early age, you actually hopefully will be able to avoid later problems in the workforce. So when I look to what would I what would I hope for young women in STEM and interested who are interested in innovation generally is that we find more avenues for them to work in team environments. I think that this will not only foster innovation, but it strengthens their resolve to be part of a, 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 team, a team building experience, strengthens their resolve to be part of a solution and to contribute to that in terms of innovating good ideas. So for me, the future needs to be really focused around how we teach kids, not one-on-one, -on -one, but work on collective learning as a really important um, element to making sure that women are raised up hopefully faster than 130 years. Absolutely. And so, Mary, as an engineering student myself, I noticed we did a lot of that working in teams. And sometimes it was easy and sometimes it was more challenging. So how are you helping your students to coalesce around each other to provide that supportive environment? And what can other students or professors do to help support within their own organization? Yeah, I think, uh, again, uh, it just uh, takes a whole village uh, to raise a patent seriously. And uh, so it just uh, starts if you are a PI in a research lab, it starts with you and also your postdocs or, you know, uh, graduate PhD students, master's students or undergraduates that you work together. So that's, I think it's, it's, it's just this uh, climate that you need to create and which needs to be supportive uh, and then encouraging. Uh, I am a, a Turkish American and I grew up uh, with the quotes of Ataturk, who is the founder of the modern Turkey. And one of his quotes resonated with me and even today. And he said, you know, everything we see in the world is the creative work of women. And he gave voting rights to women well before many European countries. I think such a supportive ecosystem for women starting from her childhood gives superb confidence and makes a great influence to raise future women leaders. So coming with such confidence myself, so that's the reflection that I try to give into my research group and my environment, uh, my micro environment and also uh, nationwide and worldwide, because as I said, as an academician, we have an influence worldwide. And uh, being uh, leading the way and, uh, and then uh, setting uh, a role model and uh, creating a pipeline, creating this supportive, uh, uh, confident you know, ecosystem, starting from your research lab and then moving up. And uh, I think uh, in academia, in engineering, as I mentioned, so we are surrounded by men. And without men, we cannot do this. And uh, as Ataturk, you know, he's a man and he did this. And so you see the result of, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, actually product of that confidence. And uh, so the men in the engineering, uh, whether they are uh, colleagues in the department or department chair, or the dean of the college and so on, they need to create similar environment. So uh, the, you see, for example, uh, they keep uh, you know, giving these workshops for women, but I think men 
needs more than women because women already kind of like aware the issues by living through the challenges. So men needs to learn more, you know, how to be more supportive and uh, and uh, uh, and curb their decisions and how to make the uh, the decision making committees inclusive to women and others and make it very diverse. I think that's the only way that I see in engineering. Uh, we don't have to wait another 136 years to improve uh, because over the 22 years of my academic life in the United States, I see that uh, a lot of room to improve and uh, and the changes are very minimal uh, from the day I started until today. It's getting better, but very slow. So we don't want to wait another 136 years. As you mentioned, we won't be alive by then. So we want to see this in our lifetime. And, uh, and then this is definitely going to be a win-win situation. As I mentioned, 50% uh, of the global population is women and uh, not wasting their talent, not wasting, you know, their, you know, uh, we need their help, right? We, we have big challenges, climate change and, and so on. So we really need everybody's uh, entrepreneurial, you know, uh, STEM approaches to solve these big problems. The problems are getting bigger and bigger. So that's why we need involvement of 100% women and men in STEM and in engineering. Yes, May I make, can I make a quick comment about that before you follow up? Um, I, we, I was listening to the prior speaker, the young woman who was being interviewed and her last comment was really struck me. She said, there is a humanization of technology going on. And she was talking about AI, she was talking about software, she was talking, and I thought to myself, and, and I've seen this myself, I don't know if the other uh, panelists would agree, over the last 10 years, I've seen interest in the areas, and particularly in engineering, all the areas, fuse with interest in other human concerns, whether it's for healthcare or population growth or, or climate, whatever. And this fusion of interests is actually opening the door for women to find a comfortable spot much quicker in entrepreneurial endeavors. I don't know if they would, if my colleagues would agree, but I, I'm fascinated by the humanization of technology because I think we are entering an area, an era where women will quickly fill those, those gaps where you're bringing together uh, concepts and interests, which can be solved only by those, the merging of those con concepts and interests, if that yeah, makes absolutely, sense. Absolutely, Paula. And, and social impact, social innovation is a key component to entrepreneurship. So if you go into starting a company because you want to make money and nothing else, your company will fail. You have to go into entrepreneurship with the mindset that you want to do good in the world, that you want to have a positive impact on the people around you, your community, and even on a global scale. So I absolutely agree that when we think about the future of STEM, it's going to be that intersectionality between creating opportunity and bringing in the insights and the knowledge that we learn going through the traditional processes. And then finally, as Mary said, having confidence. So we might want to create an impact, but without the confidence behind it, we face things like imposter syndrome. We face holding our own selves back. So Sangeeta, can you talk a little bit about where your confidence comes from? Did you have role models or what drove you to quit your job that had a steady paycheck and strike out as an entrepreneur? So, um, so I have lots of kind of thoughts going through my head as I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, um, uh, having confidence, I don't feel like we need somebody's permission to have that confidence. I believe it's innate in us. We can turn, it's our choice to turn it on or off. And 
And, and sometimes when we talk about it, women tend to talk about imposter syndrome. Everybody has imposter syndrome to a certain level. Men don't talk about it. The more you talk about it, the more it feels real. And I'll tell you, one of the women I was coaching, she was really senior, and she comes into the program and she talks about her vision and where she wanted to go and what she wanted to change. Awesome stuff. I said, oh my God, she's really awesome. And then the first thing she says was, I need to help with imposter syndrome. I said, where do you see the imposter syndrome? Help me understand. And then she realizes that she doesn't have an imposter syndrome. We have to start telling women that you don't need to, you don't necessarily have impulse. Everybody has it. Yeah, you say, yep, uh, we got to figure this out. Uh, but I have to tell you that when we launched the company, um, this was one skill, quote unquote. I don't think it's a skill, but uh, we wanted to call it a skill and we wanted to put it on the agenda of, of our skills. And I fought with my team. I said, no, this is not a skill, blah, blah, blah. But lo and behold, I find out that a lot of women need help with this. So it's a, it's a real problem. And we need to educate our women that confidence comes within you. It, is, so it also helps to have a family where your parents and their sibling help you build that confidence. Your teachers help you build the confidence. If they say, you did a great job, it feels good. You get to the next level. You get to the next level. At work, we need to recognize folks as well for recognition. My personal thing was, like, if somebody told me you can't do this, I had to prove to them that I could. And that's how I built the confidence. And then, luckily, I just truly got very lucky where I got a sponsor early in my career and a white man. Um, I didn't even know what a sponsor meant. And in, in GE days where you would identify potential talent uh, and then you would helicopter them into different jobs. And I had zero background in those jobs. And the first six months were hell, but after looking back, it was a great experience. So it kept continuing to build that confidence. So taking risk for my career totally helped build the confidence. It feels like I can go do anything. And I would mm -hmm. love for all women to have that. One of the one of the things we're doing, there's an old adage that victors write the history. And one of the things we're doing at Broadcom in order to deal with what we call the imposter syndrome is trying to shore up the history of women in technology and in STEM generally by bringing forward and underrepresented groups of color and ethnicity uh, to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an open source platform, and we're actually funding bringing more faces forward that look like the people we want to shore up and give them confidence through the WikiEd project. Uh, because history, history defines you. And it is true, we can find that confidence in ourselves, but having a background, whether it's in family or just knowledge that you learn in school, that in fact there are people like you that can and have done it, takes away that imposter syndrome. I love that, Carla. And that's something we do in our Kentucky Commercialization Fellows Program, is we talk to them about who is an entrepreneur. And inevitably, most of the time, everybody answers with a man's name, Elon Musk, or Mark Cuban, or so forth and so on. And the reason for that is because what, that's what they see. That's what they hear. That's the exposure that they get. So we talked about that supportive environment and how important that is to giving someone that confidence level. Paula, when they don't have a supportive environment, when they don't see that around them, what can women do to get themselves to that next level? Well, are you talking about young women? Yeah. Or are you trying to, yeah, when young, with young women, I honestly think that the best w thing we can do is to find as many avenues to show them free resources to congregate and develop the camaraderie and the skills. For instance, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has all free resources to set up a code club and, you know, can be easily, easily uh, tapped into by a parent or a Girl Scout leader. Uh, or a teacher, 
in a classroom. Uh, the same with Science Buddies. There, there are all these resources out there now that I think can um, accelerate the opportunities for young women to 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 find their find their power and start to use it. Excellent. And Sangeeta, same question to you. For women who are later on in their career and maybe feel that they hit that wall of support. What can they do to get to that next level to create more opportunities for engagement in their environment? Um, very, very good question because all of us probably have hit that at some point in our life. Um, uh, so what I would say is um, in business, in your career, in your life, you'll always hit walls for one reason or another. Uh, the one door closes, another one opens up. Um, as I was saying, I could have stayed in the same company throughout my career, but looking back, I'm glad I actually went to a few different companies and experienced different things, and I learned different things that I would have not learned if I had stayed within the same company. And um, so, to me, that when when a wall shows up, there are always alternatives. Many times, people sometimes are working with their direct supervisor or the manager, and the manager is the wall. That doesn't mean you can't bypass that wall and go to a skip level manager. Uh, so when women come to our, our platform asking to navigate hurdles, we don't ask them to quit their job immediately and go look for another job in another company. We actually try to help, uh, help them figure out how to navigate that hurdle. What are the things you can go do to work with the manager that you have today? Um, and if that doesn't work, the second option is how do you find people who are the peers of your manager or the skip level? And the last option is you leave the job and you go work for someplace else. That is what I would say. There's always great options and you learn so much. And I would say sometimes it feels risky to go do something different, but once you take that step, the gains are huge. As I always say, no risk, no gain. It's so important, so important for us to take some risks. Absolutely, and certainly if you do nothing, nothing will change. That's right. Yeah, I wanna add on this uh, if I can. And uh, yeah, of course, you know, again, we have maybe uh, different uh, forms of challenges in academia versus in industry, but uh, it, it is pretty much like common, uh, I would say, uh, around the, the woman and especially uh, encouraging women for entrepreneurship. Um, uh, there are uh, walls, definitely, you know, solid, solid brick walls in uh, academia as well. And uh, I think asking help uh, or consulting uh, to your colleagues or your department chair or the dean and or all the way up going to your chancellor is definitely one way to make them aware uh, about the situation. And uh, uh, I think uh, there is a, a Turkish uh, proverbial phrase that fits to this uh, uh, quite well. It says, uh, a person who has to ask for something is shamed, but a person who refuses her or him is doubly shamed. So, so that's, that's why uh, just go ask for help. And, uh, and since I received the uh, National uh, Emerging Woman Scholar Award from the American Association of University of Women in 2005, I have given uh, many nationwide presentations uh, to improve uh, women's uh, situation in STEM. Uh, uh, nationwide and also worldwide. And uh, actually, it comes to this uh, in summary that my advice to others, other young women, that do not listen to anyone, including your parents, who says you cannot do it and it is not for you. Just do it for yourself and for your future children. Because that's how you built the, the confidence. The confidence can be built also by uh, working through these uh, experiences and getting around the uh, 
and sometimes you need to uh, discover the this path to go around the walls uh, yourself also because in every micro environment uh, it could be different uh, whether you have any support from your uh, micro environment whether you are in academia whether you are a student or you are a faculty or or so on so that's why uh, the, the type of walls could be different, but as uh, Sangeeta said, there is always a way. There is always a better way doing something better. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, I think it comes to men, I think more than the woman, if men realizes that their uh, actions uh, can waste 50% of the global talent, I think they will take this more seriously and think twice before they make any decision uh, in hiring or uh, giving career opportunities uh, to women or, uh, or men. Excellent. And I think that's an action item for a male audience to take away is who are you looking at for your talent? What can you do to engage with a global population of talent pool? So, Paula, question for you. In, in one or two sentences, what is an action item you want someone to take away from this talk? I want every little girl out there to do exactly what has been recommended here. Don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to find another way to get to where you want to go and follow your dreams and passions. Don't be afraid. Excellent. And Sangeeta, sum us up. We've heard so much fantastic advice here, but what is that one critical action item that someone can do to change their life tomorrow? Um, one thing that I would say is, uh, which probably applies to a lot of these forums, I would love for us to start inviting men to these kind of forums because sometimes it feels like preaching to a choir because a lot of us understand these issues. I want, I, and I think men want to understand these issues. Sometimes when they see women in entrepreneurship, women in science, women in STEM, um, I want the topics to make sure that we attract the men into this audience as well so they can understand the other side of the equation. So I would challenge everyone in the audience to invite, start inviting men to any of these kinds of sessions. Fantastic. All the voices in the room together can make much more of an impact. Thank you all so much again for your time and for your words of wisdom. For our audience, as we said, please connect with us on LinkedIn. Follow up with the USPTO to see how you can get involved. Together, we can take that 132-year gap and shrink it down to our lifetime. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. Thank you.